Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for Saturday, April 29th, 2023. I appreciate your patience and understanding as I had to do a little schedule moving around just for this week, but I should be back on the regular schedule next week. Anyways, today in history, April 29th, 1745, a guy that most people are never taught about, Oliver Ellsworth, was born. But he was a pretty important dude at the time of the founding. He was the third chief justice of the United States. He was a member of the Continental Congress. He was in the first Senate. He was on the Committee of Detail that pr put together the first draft of the Constitution, a bunch of other stuff. If you want to learn some history about him, there's not a lot uh, about him out there, but you can probably find a book, an overview, a biography. But today I want to go through some of my favorite Oliver Ellsworth quotes and views, and even a couple of, we'll say, flip-flops as well. And to start it out, I want to talk a little bit about paper money. I'm just going to cite Oliver Ellsworth himself. And here he is in the Philadelphia Convention, August 16, 1787. Mr. Ellsworth thought this a favorable moment to shut and bar the door against paper money. The mischiefs of the various experiments which had been made were now fresh in the public mind and had excited the disgust of all the respectable part of America. So if you were smart, respectable, and supportive of liberty, you absolutely despised paper money. Fiat money, of course. Ellsworth said, paper money can in no case be necessary. Give the government credit and other resources will offer. The power may do harm. Never good. And he had an interesting take uh, co-authoring a letter with uh, Roger Sherman to the governor of Connecticut just after the Philadelphia Convention was done. This is September 26, 1787. Just listen to this, and hopefully it'll hit you the same way that it did me when I read this. The restraint on the legislatures of the several states respecting em emitting bills of credit, making anything but money a tender and payment of debts or impairing obligation of contracts, etc. Just talking about, you know, the structure of the Constitution. But instead of saying, instead of making anything but gold or silver coin a tender and payment of debts, he said money. So to, uh, to Oliver Ellsworth and Roger Sherman here, Money is money, like Thomas Paine once said, and paper is paper. There is no difference. Money is gold and silver coin. So anything but money is prohibited to the states under the Constitution. And then here, his views on war. It should be more easy to get out of war than into it. He said, there is a material difference between the cases of making war and making peace. It should be more easy to get out of war than into it. War also is a simple and overt declaration. Peace attended with intricate and secret negotiations. Writing as a landholder in December of 1787, the fifth paper, he said, I shall therefore select two powers. He's discussing his support for ratification of the Constitution. Sees he wants to talk about two powers which have been more abused to oppress and, and enslave mankind than all the others with which this or any other legislature on earth is cloaked, clothed the right of taxation or of collecting money from the people and of raising and supporting armies. I mean, with that long phrase and my screw ups and reading it, the short version is he's saying the two powers that have always been the worst tools for oppressing the people is the power of taxation and the power of raising and supporting standing armies, armies. He said, these are the powers which enable tyrants to score, scourge their subjects. Now, keep in mind, he wasn't using this as an argument to say we shouldn't have them at all. He's saying, look, they've always been like this, but that doesn't mean we should not try to set up a proper regulation of it. I think, well, that's probably a different, uh, a different discussion. Anyways, going further here in the uh, Connecticut Ratifying Convention, he gave a speech on January 7th, 1788. He said, if they make a law which the Constitution does not authorize, it is void. This is something that we've heard over and over from the founding generation, the old revolutionaries, all the way back to James Otis Jr. in his speech against the writs of assistance, the beginning of the controversy against the colonies in Great Britain in February of 1761, where he pointed out that an act against the Constitution is void because recognizing that the people hold sovereignty or final authority or the people of the several states under the Constitution 
then then it's not up to the government to determine if the Constitution has been violated. The Constitution remains the supreme law of the land, no matter what the government happens to say or do. And that's what Ellsworth is getting at here as well. If they make a law which the Constitution does not authorize, it is void. And one more time from that same speech, this Constitution does not attempt to coerce sovereign bodies states in their political capacity, recognizing there's a clear line in the sand of the powers that were delegated to the general government and those that the people reserved to the states. Here in the Philadelphia Convention on June 20th, 1787, he discusses a little bit more about federalism as well. Mr. Ellsworth seconded my Mr. Gorham moves to alter it so as to run that the government of the United States ought to consist of a supreme legislative, executive and judiciary. This alteration, Ellsworth said, would drop the word national and retain the proper title, the United States. So he wanted to make sure that it wasn't being seen as a singular national government, but instead a union of states, the United States. He wished also the plan of the convention to go forth as an amendment of the Articles of Confederation since under this idea, the authority of the legislatures could ratify it. So he actually didn't want to propose a whole new system. And some of the opponents were against that just, uh, uh, you know, in principle as well. Hey, you guys went there. We got to have unanimous approval of the states to change the system. And Ellsworth is saying, let's go that route. Let's amend the Articles of Confederation, send it to the state legislatures. And if we get unanimous approval, we can but he wasn't in favor of the what became the ratification debates where the people uh, elected ratifiers outside the state governments, at least at this point. He says, if the plan goes forth to the people for ratification, several succeeding conventions within the states would be unavoidable. And of course, that's exactly how it played out. He did not like these conventions. They were better fitted to pull down than to build up constitution. So the idea of sending it to the people of the several states, he was totally opposed to. But later, as he was writing his landholder uh, papers to support ratification, he totally took the opposite view. He praised the fact that the convention sent it to the people rather than the state legislatures, which is what he wanted here during the Philadelphia convention. I'm not sure how he flipped the switch on that, but I wanted to point out that he certainly did flip flop on that one. Here are some of the ideas that he had for what he wanted to see. He wanted uh, annual elections, very similar to what George Mason and Mason and Ellsworth were kind of at it against each other during the ratification debates, late 1787, early 1788 in a series of letters and papers. Mr. Ellsworth here was opposed to three years. Dickinson wanted to have a uh, every three years have elections. Supposing Ellsworth that even one year was preferable to two, the people were fond of frequent elections and might be safely indulged in one branch of the legislature, he moved to change it to one year. He also wanted an executive council for the president. So you'd have an executive branch. Uh, Benjamin Franklin very similarly wanted a council or a a uh, multi-person executive branch. George Mason wanted a council. Here's Ellsworth. He observed that a council had not yet been provided for the president. He conceived there ought to be one. His proposition was that it should be composed of the president of the Senate, the chief justice, and the ministers as they might be established for the departments of foreign and domestic affairs, war finance, and marine, who should advise but not conclude the president. Now, this is another place where... Uh, Ellsworth flipped uh, flipped the switch. He changed his mind because after the Philadelphia Convention, when George Mason published in, a, uh, I believe it was two times, two major times, his reasons for objecting to uh, ratification. One of the things that Mason said was, well, we don't have a council for the president and there should be. And that's one of the reasons he's opposing it. And Ellsworth totally changed his tune and railed on Mason for taking this position. So somewhere in there, either Ellsworth was convinced that uh, this was a bad idea, it was too expensive, it was too difficult to pull off, how would you get the right people, etc. Or maybe he just thought, maybe in some situations like James Madison, we know James Madison uh, did some flip-flops over the time from before the Philadelphia Convention through the Federalist Papers. He certainly changed his views 
And in some of them, he pointed out, like, for example, in a letter to George Washington, he said, look, I tried to get everything that we wanted. We didn't. I like what we have. It's the best we can get. So then he went all in on trying to sell that rather than lose. So I'm not sure if Ellsworth, because I don't know enough about him personally to understand if that's what he was doing or if he was being a flip flopper or if he was convinced, because he certainly did take a strong position where he wanted to have this uh, council for the executive branch. And then later on, it was like a terrible thing to even suggest it in landholder number six. Now, he was opposed to slavery and he wanted to see it ended, but he did not want a centralized system to force it to be ended because he thought that would lead to other problems. But here he is. uh, This is again in the Philadelphia Convention, August of 1787. As he never owned a slave, Ellsworth could not judge of the effects of slavery on character. He said, however, that if it was to be considered in a moral light, we ought to go farther and free those already in the country. So he was saying on a moral principle, we should actually have no slavery whatsoever. But it is pretty unworkable strategically, logistically, politically. So he's saying, let's not do that. But morally, that's what... um, That's what he was in favor of. And here he is again with a very similar view in the landholder number six, December of 1787. He said, all good men wish the entire abolition of slavery as soon as it can take place with safety to the public and for the lasting good of the present wretched race of slaves. So this is a very common view amongst earlier abolitionists. Uh, We saw in a number of states legislation that ended slavery, but they were called a gradual emancipation or a gradual end to slavery. Very few people wanted a radical end it immediately now, even if they thought that was the right thing. They just thought that in the present circumstances, it would be very difficult. And that's, I think, what uh, what Ellsworth is getting to here as well. We want the entire abolition but we got to do it in a way that's going to be safe to the public. Now, I'm not sure if that's a positive thing or a negative thing, or if it's just situational for the time that there's no way I can understand because I didn't live at that point. But I just thought that was really interesting to share as well. And then also he was totally like many of the people on the Federalist side, and he was one of the bigger uh, big government guys of the time. He certainly was opposed to including a Bill of Rights. He thought it would create confusion and flip the entire system upside down. And in many ways, I think this is one of the areas where the Federalists warned they were correct. But we can get into that in another episode. Here he's uh, discussing this is probably in response to George Mason. This is, again, in Landholder Number 6, December of 1787, responding to Mason's objections that there is no Declaration of Rights. And Ellsworth writes, bills of rights were introduced in England when its kings claimed all power and jurisdiction and were considered by them as grants to the people. So the king held sovereignty or final authority and a bill of rights was okayed or given the thumbs up by the king as the king saying, "Okay, you can have this. But in the American system, sovereignty, power, power flows from the people. And so then everything is the other way around. And Ellsworth points that out. He said they are insignificant since government is considered as originating from the people and all the power government now has is a grant from the people. So he's saying it's superfluous to include a Bill of Rights because it, like if you're talking about free speech or the right to keep and bear arms, they haven't been delegated any power to uh, to interfere in those areas in the Constitution anyways. So if you start marking that, oh, well, stuff is reserved, people might start reading it differently because that's how it always has been. He said to have inserted in this Constitution a Bill of Rights for the states would suppose them to derive and hold their rights from the federal government when the reverse is the case. And I think that's a pretty compelling argument because today we see that how that's pretty much how it's played out instead of seeing this as only a partial list. Well, for not, of course, for you, but for the general population, in essence, they they generally look at the Bill of Rights as a grant of rights. Oh, well, the Bill of Rights granted us a right to privacy or granted us the right to keep and bear arms. And then when you do that, Eventually, it's going to be up to the people who granted you that right to determine how much of that right you get to exercise instead of, again, the other way around what Ellsworth was trying to say as well. 
Uh, later on, he made an interesting point that I just uh, I'm not sure how well I can get this into the flow of this discussion here. But it's an interesting point where he's discussing uh, in the Senate in 1796, the idea of letting Congress do something that seems innocuous that they're not authorized to do. This is something that Jefferson warned about in uh, his opposition to Alexander Hamilton's National Bank, which Ellsworth, I believe, was pretty influential in supporting as well, where he said to take a single step beyond the limits of the Constitution is to take a boundless field of power. And Ellsworth is saying something similar here. He said to Congress were given the powers of legislation and the right of declaring war. If authority beyond this is assumed, however trifling the encroachment at first, where will it stop? So it doesn't matter how trifling or small the encroachment or the usurpation is beyond the limits of the Constitution. If you allow them to do that, it will never, ever stop. I mean, it hasn't. So that's a pretty good question. And here he is writing one more time as the landholder in his third paper in November. He said, a power of doing good always implies a power to do evil if the person or party be disposed. And this is a longstanding maxim. As long as you give government the power to do something you like, someone in the future who absolutely despises what you like will also have that same power and they could turn that power against you. Now here, Ellsworth, like John Jay, the first chief justice who made a similar argument, is saying like, look, we all have to accept this. But that doesn't mean don't give them any power at all. They were using it as an argument to say, let's have more energetic government. And just because someone might use it badly doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We have to figure out how to deal with them if they do the wrong thing. And I'm not sure if they were right on that or not, but they were recognizing this important maxim at the same time while arguing for greater centralized power in the new system. A power of doing good always empower, implies a power to do evil if the person or party be disposed. I thought that was a good one to wrap up with. And I also wanted to point you to another episode that I did similar to this, uh, discussing the first chief justice, John Jay, and many of his views over his career. I did that back in October of 2022. I will link to it in the show notes. First chief justice. They don't make them like they used to. And again, I will link to all these original source documents in the show notes about an hour or two after this live stream is done over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. If you find this type of history interesting, plus all the strategic work that we do to support the Constitution and liberty when the government refuses to do what it's supposed to do, which is constant. Nothing helps us get this kind of work done more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending a little bit of your time with me today. I hope you're having a great weekend so far. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you next week here on the path to liberty.